In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. How did we finally settle that out, Chiefs or Eagles? I can never manage to watch football down here. I don't know. My TV won't work, or maybe I don't work. So you all know it's Super Bowl Sunday today, but gentlemen, Tuesday is Valentine's Day. In case that has slipped your mind, a woman walked into a post office just before Valentine's Day, and she was surprised to see a not terribly attractive middle-aged fellow standing at the counter methodically placing love stamps onto bright pink envelopes covered with hearts. What are you doing, sir, if I might inquire? Asked the curious woman as the fellow pulled out a bottle of perfume and began to spritz the envelopes. <laughs> well, I'm sending out a thousand valentines, the man said matter-of-factly. You have 1,000 beloveds to send cards to, asked the woman. Well, not exactly, said the fellow. It's just that business is slow and I'm a divorce attorney. <laughs> Boo. We began listening to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel two weeks ago. And Jesus is still at it today. That was one long sermon up there on the Mount. You have nothing to complain about ever again <laughs> with my long sermons. And I must confess that if we didn't read through an appointed lectionary, in the Anglican Church, you might never have heard this part of the Sermon on the Mount, because what Jesus says about plucking out eyes and cutting off arms and divorce and oath-making creates in us some discomfort. It does not have to, for reasons I'll come to in a while. But to get started, let me suggest that we have here today what might be called a threefold social teaching and a threefold political teaching. The long and short of Christ's teaching is that our inner dispositions have practical consequences, both personally and in the way personal decisions play out in relationships and in community. The three personal teachings in this section have to do with anger, lust, and divorce. And the three political teachings have to do with oath-taking, retaliation, and peacemaking. That's a lot of ground to cover on Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> Maybe we can walk away at least with some sense of what Jesus is up to in this part of the long Sermon on the Mount. Jesus does a remarkable thing in this reading, and I don't want you to miss the ramifications of what he does. He claims for himself an authority more fundamental and powerful than the authority of the written text defining Judaism. You have heard it said to those of ancient times, Jesus tells his hearers. And scholars universally agree that he is talking about the Torah, the law, the prophets, and the writings. You have heard it said, but I say to you. Jesus claims for himself the authority to interpret the text. By implication, that authority now resides within the church. It is a great irony 
that those who try to literally apply Jesus' teaching on divorce or oath or taking seem to miss the obvious point that Jesus is involved in a reinterpretation of ancient texts. The first lesson we should derive from this section of Matthew's Gospel is that Scripture requires our engagement, our participation, and our interpretation. All Scripture is always interpreted by someone. And if the ancient times needed reinterpreted in the first century, it's a fair bet that they require a bit of reinterpretation in the 21st. The Bible is not an answer book. It doesn't speak with one voice, and it did not fall out of the sky like the golden tablets of Moroni. When we open our Bibles, we have work to do. A literalist interpretation of Scripture emerged in the aftermath of the Reformation. Scripture became the primary reference point for the Reformers who were trying to trim back the overgrown bush of medieval Roman Catholicism. And because authority resided in medieval Roman Catholicism in the councils of the church, they were looking for some other source of authority. And they looked to a literalist interpretation of the Bible. But in England, the Anglican Church was at least as alarmed by the Puritans as it was by medieval Roman Catholicism, which is why the Puritans got out of Dodge and went to Plymouth Rock. <laughs> the Puritans so closely tied their theology to the written text of Scripture that a certain sentiment arose among them that everything required proof texting from the Bible. That approach to Scripture continues to dominate the fundamentalists and the evangelicals who are the spiritual children of the Puritans, but it has never been and is not now the Anglican approach to Scripture. The Anglican strand of Christianity emphasized reason, choice, duty, and conscience in matters of faith. These disciplines acquired a new status in the lives of faithful Anglican Christians, resisting medieval accretions on the one hand and Puritan Biblicism on the other. Progress in the Christian life was the goal, rather than conformity to a revealed template. And so Anglican priest William Nicholson was able to write this, quote, Now, in the law of God, God expects from us in this life not absolute perfection, but such perfection as may be had in this life, which the Aquinian school, that is the school of Thomas Aquinas, calls perfectio viatorum, the perfection of wayfaring men and women, and defines it thus, when the will of human beings habitually entertains nothing that is contrary to the love of God, end quote. That seems to be part of Jesus' project in his teachings today. He is instructing us in how wayfaring men and women ought to live. You have to go deeper than the written law, he says. It is necessary to gain self-mastery over inward intent and disposition. Jesus suggests that the attitudes we develop are in and of themselves public acts. Theologian Dale Bruner, a friend of mine who wrote the two weightiest volumes on the commentary of Matthew, the world has ever seen, and I was going to bring them in to show you them, but I thought they might break the pew by David Burton and we wouldn't get him up for 10 minutes. <laughs> Dale Bruner wrote, the Sermon on the Mount does not teach a mere attitude ethic or purely inward morality. Jesus commands deeds. Jesus shows that the attitudes 
we carry around are already public acts and as such answerable to God. Nurture anger and it will lead to violence. Disrespect others and you will curse them one way or the other. Cultivate lust and it will lead to a violation of fundamental relationships. The dispositions of the heart matter and we can and must make choices about how we form our dispositions. There is a Lakota wisdom tale. Those are the northern tribes, the indigenous people that we used to call the Sioux. It is still told to Lakota children. The tale goes like this. Everyone has two wolves that live inside their heart. One of the wolves is generous and good, guards the perimeter of the camp, and cherishes the tribe. The second wolf is rapacious, stealing the tribe's food and mauling the weak and the vulnerable. These two wolves circle one another inside the heart of every warrior to see which will gain advantage. Well, grandfather, which of the wolves will win? says the Lakota child. And grandfather answers, whichever one you choose to feed. In 1860, the year Abraham Lincoln was elected president, a 23-year-old named Milton Bradley created a board game which he called the Game of Life. Starting on a square labeled infancy, the player followed 64 red and ivory squares along the checkerboard since no one lived much longer than 64. That was deemed a sufficient number. And along the way, you tried to go to school and you tried to do those things that yielded in the happiness of others. Choosing politics almost always guaranteed defeat, by the way. Milton Bradley's propitious squares emphasized honesty, bravery, and perseverance. The negative squares were poverty, idleness, and disgrace. 100 years later, during the Kennedy administration, the Milton Bradley Company updated the game for the first time. This new version had fake money, like Monopoly, replica stock certificates, and replica insurance policies. In the 1960 version, the player who finished with the most money won. Then, the Milton Bradley Company released a 21st century update. The new game of life, twists and turns. In this version, there is no goal. Avoiding idleness isn't a goal, nor is the pursuit of the happiness of others. The blurb on the box reads, a thousand ways to live your life, you choose. Each player receives a visa card to track <laughs> points and you earn the same number of points for scuba diving as you do for donating a kidney or earning a PhD. And the new game has no square marked finish. It is a pointless exercise and it is frightening to the degree that it reflects contemporary values. The first version of the game of life proffered goals not the recent version, but we know better, don't we? Character is destiny. Character is something we have a hand in creating. When someone fails to shape within themselves good character, the outcome does not bode well for them, does not bode well for the web of relationships in which they find themselves, nor for the institutions upon which they touch. Moses' final words to the Hebrew people as he prepares to die on the mountain. 
as they prepare to enter a new land is that there are a thousand choices every day, a thousand opportunities to align with goodness or to act in selfish and self-defeating ways. Choose life and live, Moses tells them. Choose which wolf you will feed. External rules and regulations are not sufficient. What is needed is a transformation of the heart. Discipline and self-mastery starves the rapacious wolf and feeds the good wolf. You are God's field. You are God's building, St. Paul tells us today in 1 Corinthians. St. Paul says when we're doing things right, we're dedicated to the formation of character. And we sharpen one another as iron sharpens iron for common purpose. Life is not pointless. Its beginning is hid with God and so is its end at which God will weigh the substance of our choices and decisions. Wrestling with the library of books we call the Bible provides good fodder for wrestling with the enduring questions with which human beings always struggle. To pretend that the Bible can be read literally, golden tablets fallen down from the sky, is to avoid the struggle for character, which they require. We are free, and we are free to bend our disposition toward the good, for our own well-being, and for the well-being of those with whom we share the journey. We are, as St. Paul said, God's building. And so, O oh Lord, in whom we live and move and have our being, help us to watch our thoughts, because they will become our words. And help us to watch our words, because they will become our deeds. And help us to watch our deeds, because they will become our habits. And help us to watch our habits, because they will become our character and help us to watch our character because that will become our destiny. Inform our reason and our conscience, O oh God, that we might often choose well, encouraging one another, wayfaring men and women on a pilgrim path. Amen.